Hello, Bay Harbor. I'm Paul Kleins. I'm the pastor here. And um, in these strange times, I wanted to touch base with you just a, a little bit and tell you a couple of things happening that you may not know because you're not in the sanctuary here where I am. So let me tell you that even though we're not here in this room, I've said it so many times, I'll say it again. Bay Harbor is alive and well, just in a very different way than we have been in the past. We have teams of people, and you can join one if, you, if you'd like to, who are, who are making prayer calls and calling people and, and I'm praying with them over the phone. What a great encouragement. We have errand runners who are um, helping people who are quarantined or shut in at home or unavailable to get out, who are picking up groceries or prescriptions or medicine or, or Chick-fil-A combos, whatever it is. I mean, we have people who are ready and willing to help with that. We have, we have people who are calling every member and every person, every family who's a part of our congregation just to touch base and say, hey, we're here and we're caring for you and praying for you. Making these calls of every family that we're aware of anyway in our congregation. Our children's ministry is has gone online and on the children's ministry, Bay Harbor Children's Ministry Facebook page, if you have kids, you need to be there or grandkids, they need to be there because they're doing great programming um, that's fun and engaging and just right for kids. Our student ministry on our student ministry, Bay Harbor student Instagram page, um, they're, they're producing all kinds of creative, funny, interesting, clever, ridiculous content that is um, just geared to junior high and high school students. And if you have junior high and high school students, or if you're one, um, check out the Bay Harbor Instagram page and find out more about that. Um, small groups, believe it or not, are still continuing to meet even in the quarantine. They're just meeting digitally through um, video conferencing applications like Zoom or Google Meetup. And, and through those applications, small groups are still able to keep in touch with each other, pray together, and even have Bible study together. It's, it's beautiful what's happening around here. We have Stephen ministers that are available for people who are really going through a tough time, whether related to the coronavirus or just, just life. Maybe life is just really hard and this just kind of makes a already, an already difficult or maybe some grief you're struggling with just makes it even worse because you feel so alone. Our Stephen ministers are wonderful, trained, caring men and women who, um, though we can't meet in person, they are available to call you and listen and pray and, and care for you. And they're beautiful and it's such a powerful ministry that they do. So know that Bay Harbor is indeed alive and well. And then I guess I'd just say, help us help you. If you're alone, reach out to us. If you'd like to serve, reach out to us. If, if you haven't received a care call, somebody calling to touch base with you, um, or text or email. How, I mean, we're trying every way we can. But if you haven't received any contact from Bay Harbor personally for your family, um, please, please let us know. We want to be here for you in every way and any way that we possibly can. Until this is over, we're going to stay in touch and we're going to be praying and serving and giving and reaching out to the world around us to remind them that Jesus Christ, who is the hope of the world, is alive and well today. So God bless you, Bay Harbor. Please stay in touch. If you need it, the easiest way is to go on any one of the multiple platforms that we have. Of course, our website, our Bay Harbor app, our Facebook page, our Instagram page, um, or old, if, you know, old fashioned, um, you can just email us at info, I-N-F-O, info at bayharborumc.org. So stay in touch with us and give us the privilege of staying in touch with you during this time. God bless you. Well, it's another Sunday during this coronavirus pandemic. and not being able to meet together. Okay, well, at least I get a good parking place, but I'm so tired of not being able to meet with together with people. 
Gosh, Sundays are completely different than they've ever been in my life, and I don't really like it. So the sanctuary's still empty. It's the third Sunday in another empty sanctuary. I know that it's possible and even important to worship God in lots of different ways. I know that I can worship God by myself. I know I can worship God anywhere. Man, I miss worshiping with my church family in this place. I miss being together with people.
cast down our idols. Oh, give us clean hands. Give us your hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, give us clean hands. Oh, give us your hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your Today I want to ask you to think with me about one of the strangest stories in the New Testament. I mean, the Bible has a lot of strange stories in it, but this one in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, it's one of the strangest stories for sure coming out of the life of Jesus. It's a story in Mark, chapter 8, beginning verse 22 that goes through 26. And Well, let me just, let me read this story to you. Um, it says... Again, Mark chapter 8, beginning verse 22. It says, Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him and heal him. Taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village. After spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on the man, he asked him, Do you see anything? And the man looked up and said to Jesus, I see people, but they look like trees. Only they are walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. He looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored and he could see everything clearly. What a strange story. This blind man comes to Jesus and Jesus spits in his eyes. 
And then he puts his hands on the blind man and the blind man can't see or only partially see. And so Jesus puts his hands on him again and then he can see. What is going on with that story? It really, it really is a strange story involving something really gross. Jesus spitting on somebody. And so I want us to think about that story in context of this, our third Sunday, not meeting because of the coronavirus pandemic. Let me say some just a general thing couple of general thoughts about the story if um, if you're wondering about this spitting thing that Jesus did and this is an especially cool story if you're like an eight-year-old boy because what eight-year-old boy doesn't like spitting right and so let me just say to all the eight-year-old boys out there if you read this story or hear Pastor Paul talking about Jesus spitting and go around spitting and then your mom gets mad at you and say, well, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. No, that's not how this works. The thing about spitting is, is that spitting is always gross. In every culture, in every time, in every language, spitting is disgusting, repulsive and gross. So even though Jesus spit in this story, that doesn't mean we're supposed to go around spitting. So that's the first thing. I want to get that out of the way. And the second thing I want to say, because different people interpret this, you know, in this way, Jesus doesn't have magic spit. He doesn't have, his spit doesn't have supernatural healing properties. That's not what this story is saying. Some, some have even said that, that because spitting is disgusting and gross, and blindness would have been in that time considered disgusting and gross, that Jesus was spitting on the blindness to say, I think you're terrible. That's ridiculous. That's not, that's not at all what's happening here. Spitting is always gross in every culture and every time. Jesus doesn't have magic spit. And the other thing to, to remember about this story is that it's not the spit that heals this guy. It's Jesus touching him that heals the man. So it kind of makes us ask the question, well then what's going on in this story? And so let me just say a couple of things about that. First of all, always consider the context of the story. The only way to understand scripture is to understand it within its historical and literary context. And in the context of this story, we know that Jesus had been in ministry for about three years. He's, this is toward the end of his three-year ministry. And throughout his three-year ministry, his purpose has been consistent to proclaim that he is the Messiah sent by God. But he's not the Messiah the people thought he would be. Jesus was a first century Jew coming to first century Jewish people. These first century Jewish people of Jesus' day, they were living in, they were an occupied people living under the repressive, terrible, horrific rule of the Roman, of the Roman government, Roman leaders. They couldn't stand being under the oppressive rule of the Romans. And for centuries, they had been praying for God to send a new king, a Messiah would be the Jewish word for king, a new king who would, who would free them from Roman oppression, set them free, and reestablish a Jewish kingdom. So they were waiting for a Messiah, and Jesus was a Messiah, just not the Messiah they thought. Jesus did come to free people from oppression, but not just the Jewish people. He came to free all people from oppression. And he did come to establish a nation or a kingdom, as Jesus called it, but it wasn't a Jewish kingdom. It was the kingdom of God. And every person was welcome to be a part of this kingdom. And so for his three years of ministry, Jesus was was consistently trying to prove that he was the Messiah, just not the Messiah they were waiting for. And he did it in all kinds of ways. He did it by teaching about the kingdom of God and what it meant to be a part of the kingdom of God and what he had come to do. He did it in his teaching. He did it in his actions by demonstrating what it was to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God, by, especially by how he loved so well, and especially by loving people who were made to feel like they didn't belong by 
outsiders or the people who felt the least loved were the ones that Jesus went to and loved and said, you too can be a part of my kingdom. And he also did it with miracles. The miracles that Jesus did were were intentional to prove that he had the power of God inside of him. He did the things and said the things that only God could possibly do or possibly say. When Jesus said, I forgive you of your sins, it was startling because only God can forgive sins. When Jesus would heal people, it was startling because only Jesus could heal people. So for three years, Jesus is trying to prove that he is the Messiah, but not the Messiah they wanted. Not a Jewish Messiah for Jewish people to set up a Jewish state, but he was God in the flesh. To come to free every people, every person from their oppression and to establish the kingdom of God. But after three years, nobody was getting it. Nobody understood. The crowds, the religious people, even Jesus' closest followers could not, did not understand the ministry and the purpose of Jesus. And now it's toward the end of his three years. They're on their way in Mark chapter 8. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus knows what is about to happen in Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested and crucified and rise from the dead. He knows what's about to happen and even his closest followers don't get it. And so as they're walking to Jerusalem, I'll bet Jesus was in, the, in his mind saying, how am I going to convince these people? How am I going to re- show these people? Why, why can't they see And then some people bring a blind man to Jesus and say, Jesus, our friend is blind. Can you help him see? And Jesus, yes, I came to help people see. And so he spits in the blind blind man's eyes. Why does he spit? Here's, here's, Here's why. Here's why. Because Jesus is trying to awaken his disciples to who he really is he's trying to startle them out of their complacency so they could see who Jesus truly is and just another healing just another recovery of sight just another miracle it won't do it he's done so many miracles but they still couldn't see so he needed to do something different and so when the blind man comes Jesus says okay this is going to get their attention and he spits in the blind man's eyes for sure that got their attention. And so he spits in his blind, man, blind man's eyes and he puts his hand over his eyes and he removes his hands and he says to the blind man, do you see? And the blind man rubs his eyes and he looks around and he says, well, I see, I see, but I don't see. I mean, I see, but everything's fuzzy. Everything's blurry. I see, I just don't see clearly. I see people, but they're like trees walking around. I wonder if when that man said that, I wonder if Jesus looked over at his disciples. Because like this blind man, they see, but they don't see. They see Jesus. They saw his miracles. They heard his teaching. They could see, but they couldn't see. And one of the ways that we can know that this is what's going on under the surface here is because in the very next verse, after this story of healing the blind man, Jesus is with his disciples walking to Jerusalem. And he says, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, well, they say you're the Elijah. Some say you're John, the different things. Jesus turns to him and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Christ, the Messiah. And Peter says, you're right. You see. But Jesus knew Peter didn't really see. Because Jesus goes on and says, well, we're on our way to Jerusalem. And I'm going to be arrested. And I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to die. But I'm going to rise on the third day. And Peter blurts out oh no Jesus that's impossible you're our king we're we're going to Jerusalem to take down the Romans we're gonna fight for you don't worry about dying we got you and Jesus tells Peter Peter you see but you don't see like the blind man who could see but he doesn't see 
And so what does Jesus do? This is what I love about this story. Jesus doesn't say to the blind man who can see but not see. He doesn't say to him, what's the matter with you? Why are you such a slow learner? Why don't you have faith? He doesn't say that. He doesn't tell the blind man, well, try harder. Rub your eyes. Here, put on these glasses. No, he doesn't do any of that stuff. He just reaches out and touches him a second time. And when Jesus touches him a second time, the man can see. He can see. It wasn't until after the resurrection that Jesus' disciples could see clearly. But it was after the resurrection when it all made sense and the disciples could see. And it was then that God took these disciples Slow of, slow of seeing, hard to see, somewhat dysfunctional in so many ways, failures in almost every way. But then after the resurrection, they could see. And God took those disciples and used them to begin a movement that has brought salvation and hope and peace and joy to countless billions of people. Still today, that movement continues on. But yet still today, there's far too many people who can see, but they can't see. I mean, even those of us who follow Christ in the world that we live in today, it's sometimes hard to see, isn't it? I mean, we live in the world of global pandemic of a proportion that nobody a living has ever been through before. Our own homes, our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities, our state, our nation, the whole world has been affected and devastated in different ways by this. The economy is falling, businesses are closing, people are losing their jobs. Tens and tens of thousands had the coronavirus. Thousands upon thousands have died and people who seem to know what they're talking about say we're still at the front end of this. and this likely to get worse before it gets better for us. And when we hear that, and it seems like that's all we hear, it can, for good reason, seems, can cause great fear and anxiety, and even for many people, a sense of hopelessness. Maybe you're feeling some of that. People around you certainly are. It's easy for us to see, but not see. In the midst of what we're going through, to wonder, well, where is God in the midst of this pandemic? It may seem like God is quiet or silent or unmoved or uncaring or impotent. Because it's easy for us to see, but not see. And the thing I love about the story of Mark 8 is... Jesus is so patient. He doesn't get mad or frustrated or put out. He doesn't walk away from us. But what he does for us is what he did to that blind man. He just reaches out his hand and he'll touch us a second time. If we ask him to, allow him to, what we will find in Jesus is a second touch that enables us to see what we can't see. Because when it comes to this pandemic, what we see on the news or on our news feed isn't everything that's happening. This pandemic isn't everything. The health crisis and the economy and the businesses closing and the quarantine and the hospitals that are filled with patients, it's not everything. Though the news may make us think it is, and all the conversations around us and our social media platforms may think it is, the truth is, is that there is something else going on around here. That God is at work. He's at work as He has always been in the lives of people. His church, the people who belong to God, who God has called to bring hope and peace and joy and salvation to a world that only knows hopelessness and fear 
and anxiety. And so I'm praying for you, my friends, that that you will know that second touch of Jesus. That you will know the power of the resurrection that is more powerful than anything in all this universe. And that having received that second touch, that ability to see that there is more going on around here than what the news tells us, that you and we together would be a part of this great, magnificent, beautiful movement of God that He is using to bring hope and peace and salvation to the world around us. I love that weird story about Jesus spitting in Mark chapter 8 because it reminds us that there's a lot of people who can see but don't see but Jesus patiently touches us again and enables us to see and then calls us into his service to be the ambassadors of hope to the world around us I pray that you would call on him For that second touch when you feel fear and anxiety and hopelessness. There's no magic words or magic spit. It's just simply saying the most simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I need you in this situation. I can't see you. And so help me see. Lord, I need you in my life. Make that your prayer when fear and anxiety and hopelessness starts bubbling up in your mind. Turn off the TV, put your phone down, and find hope on the pages of Scripture. And then, when you're able to see the more that's at work around us, put on your shoes and let's be the hope of the world for a world that is hopeless. That's what the church has always been, especially in times like this. God bless you.